we're continuing our study in William Wordsworth and the Romantic Movement because uh, in studying Wordsworth, I am introducing you to the, one of the great writers uh, in English. Uh, but also I want to introduce a, a transformation in uh, what's often called worldview. I'm not huge on the term, I think it's problematic, but uh, let's, let's use that provisionally at any rate. Uh, because what is happening in the Romantic period <laughs> is a change in perspective of a sort that is, uh, has enormous consequence for the way that we look at the world. It's not just because they idealize nature in a way that divinizes nature. I suggested that already. Uh, last class and the class before when I talked about Blake, I talked about how nature had taken on associations of goodness and sanctity, etc., that we still hold to this day. And um, in so doing, we depart from both a biblical sense of what nature is, uh, because nature is not really referred to in scripture, creation is, but also even a classical worldview does not contain the idea that nature is fundamentally good. Even if it is divine in some ways, it's not, uh, it's not that there's no presence of evil in it, whereas the romantics really idealize nature and divinize it and find us uh, the association of our thoughts with nature as a way of renovating the problems of human nature. That's Wordsworth's project is to meditate and reflect on the way in which he is present in the water, in the air, in the grass, uh, in the skies, in the minds of other human beings, etc. There's a, a fundamental oneness there which he uh, has lost, or he and his whole culture has lost because of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment has severed things through its rational uh, emphasis and resulted in a divorce between, uh, between people, between the, the rulers and the ruled. And uh, so there's a, a, a strong visceral response against reason that takes place in this period that is actually a, a, entirely irrational. And one of the things that's always disturbed me in the Christian community, I'm an adult convert, is that the romantic take on uh, reason is largely a, ro is a romantic take. The Christian take on reason is a romantic take, which is to say that reasoning is a thing that divides us. It's de inherently divisive and it's dehumanizing. Whereas to really get close to people and to understand them as they really are, we need to use the imagination or our feelings. And this is a very romantic form of argumentation and fundamentally denies what uh, the church fathers taught about the fundamental nature of human nature, namely that we uh, bear the image of God, but, to be a, but furthermore, but that to be a human being is to have the power of reason. It's something that separates us from the animals. Um, and, and so by going after reason, broadly speaking, without any sense of distinction, any qualification, what we're doing is going against the distinguishing feature of human nature. That, it's one of the distinguishing features. The other one is that we uh, are persons. This is a picture of the Madonna and the Christ child. Note how the Christ child looks like a little old man. And, and this is very common in the Renaissance and even more so in the medieval period. You'll never get a baby this ugly. Uh, or if you did, you had a baby like this and was saying, oh, your baby's so cute. And they're like, you're lying. This is, not, this is an extraordinarily ugly baby. And, and it's, what it's not intended to be, by the way, is an accurate depiction of what a child looks like. A baby. It's not that they, didn't, they weren't capable of of realistically portraying babies at, at this age. But in the Renaissance, they tend to move towards realism. But there's an ideal here that's still a vestige of the medieval period, and that's in seeing in the baby Christ, the adult Christ. Sometimes the baby has an enormous head, by the way. You'll see medieval pictures, and Christ has got this planetary-sized noggin exp <laughs> expressing his wisdom. So it's symbolic. 
there's a, there's a and, and it's not realistic portrait, it's, it's expressing something about the object being depicted. But here we have two persons and there's a relationship of a mother to a child. Sometimes the uh, Madonna has her breast out and the child's nurturing from it. So it expresses love and nurture and growth and, and connection and, and the personhood of the two of, of them is being depicted. But note also that, uh, something important about the feature, the child has a bird in his hand, by the way, here, if you can't see it, uh, is that we can see both of their faces. In, very important, and maybe you might say not worth noting, but note how they're both front and center, the focus of the, of the painting, and I could go through a whole slide deck of photos from the period, you would see that characteristic Renaissance painting has a sort of a triangular, uh, golden triangle there where, where there's this idea, and you can see it there, the, the center of the painting is the people in the foreground. And the background is just that. It's background, it's not really significant for, for the foreground. It's very unusual to set something significant in the background in this period. Your attention is drawn to what's in the foreground and what's in the foreground are two people in a loving relationship, very much. So a strong humanistic influence here representing the importance of the human persons here. And this human person who is a baby is being seen also as the man who will bear away the sins of the world. This is the savior. And what he does as a man is, at, is more consequential than he does simply by becoming a human being and taking on human flesh. So that's what's portrayed in this picture. And the reason I say this is to contrast it with this picture from the Romantic era. Now, I just want you to compare and contrast, and this is going to illustrate something about Wordsworth's poetics as well, I'm submitting to you. And that is, what do you notice is the difference between the two pictures? Sure. Give me, I mean, there's a long list of things, but yes. Okay, he's got his back to us. Good. First point. So what's the perspective? What are, what's he looking at? What are we looking at? The background. The background becomes more important than the foreground. By having his back to us, we're, we're, we, we are, we're in a sense looking at what he's looking and not really looking at him. We're to see ourselves in him to some degree. He represents us, but he's not distinct from us. There's no human distinctiveness about him. We can't see his face. Faces reveal something about people. Very important, faces are individual, highly individual. You can recognize people by the distinctive features of their faces and by their expressions. Human beings are capable of expressing their ideas, their emotions, their thoughts through their facial expressions. You can, you can express a lot of things with your face, and we call it acting for a reason. Animals can't act, by the way. They, don't also, they also don't have faces. I know that you think that they do, and children's cartoons convince you that they do, but they don't have faces. In the same way that we do, they don't express their emotions in their faces. Your dog's face. <laughs> He's smiling, it's always the same. He's either smiling or he's not smiling, but normally he's smiling. They're, they're, and they're, there's a fixed number of expressions and they don't express their thoughts through their faces, their feelings, although they have feelings, which they share with us. The feelings that we mean by that are simply sensations. They have sensations, they feel hurt, they get anxious, they get distressed, whatever, but they don't express it through their faces. Their faces don't indicate what's going on in their souls. Whereas with us, it does. It's part of the human nature of hu humanity. And we see that in the faces that will be portrayed. The downward eyes here, the sidelong glance, all of these things will indicate certain things. I'm here not to do an art history class, but just to mo note points of distinction. The romantic here is furthermore on a mountain, at the peak of the mountain. He's climbed up and he's looking into a landscape that's murky, misty, and obscure in some way. It's a sublime landscape. He's looking just like the, to the, the Palace of Versailles was up in the clouds. Uh, same way here, it's a solitary who's climbed a mountain. And when I say he, I'm presuming a great deal. I have no idea whether this is a man or a woman because I can't see his face. And you say it is a man because of his hair, but women can cut their hair short as well. And you, I can't see his hips and I can't see his breasts. 
if he has any. I have no idea. This is an individual, and that's the point. It represents every individual in that sense, without the distinctions of, of that we call sexual differentiation. Yes? It's not that clear from this. It's not, it's not declaring an end to reason. But l l let me add one further thing that might, might be helpful. Uh, there is a philosopher of the name of Immanuel Kant, whom you've probably studied in your philosophy class, uh, Critique of Pure Reason, Dr. Davis. Yes? And um, in the Critique of Pure Reason, he talks about the skepticism of David Hume posing significant problems for him. And um, he wants to counter Hume's skepticism. And Hume is skeptical that we can know things on the basis of appearances, which is all that we can see with our eyes. Empirically, we can see things, but we can't conclude things. He says, we can't make cause and effect statements on the basis of what we observe. So that means we can't actually know metaphysical matters. We can't know theology, etc., cetera, we, because we can only observe things that we can see. And so he's very skeptical about those things. Uh, Immanuel Kant comes along and suggests that to solve this problem, we should do something that he calls a Copernican turn. Have you heard, have you heard this? Or I don't know if you have. I don't want to reiterate too much. But well, I'll, I'll just say it briefly. Have you heard of Copernicus? If you were with me last semester, you might have. Well, I said it, but you might not have been paying attention or might not remember. Nicholas Copernicus is an astronomer who proposes that, the, that rather than the planets revolve around the Earth, which is just common sense. You can see the sun rise in the morning, it sets in the evening. You can see the moon move around the Earth, etc. And there's day and night, it suggests that these things are going around us. That's, that's the common sense observation. And astronomy was built on the Ptolemaic cosmology with the Earth at the center and the other planets revolving around it. Copernicus suggested that that's actually not the way it worked. Instead, he suggested that everything revolved around the sun in what we call the solar system. And despite what we see, that's not actually what's happening here. And he demonstrated through various means. And then Galileo came around and proved with his telescope that Ptolemy was wrong. It could not be that the Earth was standing still. It must be the case that the Earth, in fact, is revolving around the sun, in which case we have a serious problem with trusting our senses. Because I don't feel like I'm moving at all, and neither does any of you. If you're sitting down, I, I trust. Or if you do, it's because you feel queasy and there's a problem. It's not the norm for you. You feel like you're not moving. And when you want to move, then you move your body and then things move. But you're, you're static and everything else may be moving, like the sun. And it so bothers Descartes that he proposes a solution to that, which he calls the method of doubt. He's going to doubt anything. He's not going to trust anything. He's going to doubt ab absolutely everything, and in including that the sun rises and the sun sets. He actually mentions this. And he is only going to trust things that he can prove beyond doubt. And what can he prove beyond doubt? There's only one thing that he's doubting. He can't doubt that he's doubting. He knows that he's doubting, and if he's doubting, that means he's thinking. And if he's thinking, he says, then I must exist. And so he says, I, th I think, therefore I am. And if I exist, I can imagine a being infinitely great that created me and all things. So then God's existence comes from that. But it's from the method of doubt. That's Descartes' solution to the problem of Copernicus. Kant's solution is more radical, and it's, and it's very different. He says, rather than imagine the world exists outside of me and that I look upon it and I see a bunch of objects 
and I conclude things on the basis of my study of the objects outside of me, let me do a quasi Copernican turn and flip it around and rather than see a world outside of me, imagine or think that what it, I'm really exercising is the power of my mind to perceive a reality. So rather than objects con me conforming to the objects outside of me, the objects con conform to my capacity to perceive them. He calls it the subjective turn, or others call it the subjective turn. It flips things around. So reality is dependent on my capacities. It's not dependent on God's ordinance of things outside of me. There's not an external world. He, he flips it inward. So it's our capacity to understand things that determines reality. And so then he talks about the conditions of, of thought, of cognition, that will, are necessary for that, for what we call understanding to take place. He calls it pure reason, the critique of pure reason. So he gets rid of all external prejudices in form of a pure form of reason that will no longer look at the world, but rather look at the mind as the way of receiving that. Now that's a flip inward. It's turning inward and saying the reality lies within us. And because of this turn, psychology becomes the, the, the queen of the sciences because it's really the study of our minds. And sociology is the study of psychology across new other people and anthropology is studying it over the course of time. Three new disciplines, psychology, sociology, anthropology arise right in this period. And interesting note, they throw out theology from the university at the same time say that's not a form of knowledge at all. And we will bring in what they will call the spirit, the Geisteswissenschaft and the human sciences in their place. But, but this illustrates the Kantian subjective turn is, was the point of that little excursion. Because it is looking at this, but really the object of, that we're looking at is yes, the landscape, but actually it's this my, man's mind. We can't see his face, but we're thinking what he's thinking. It's his mind that's the thing that's being depicted in this painting. You see that. Note that it's a solitary as well. It's a man in solitude. It, it's, he's not in relation to other people. He represents every single individual, but they are, we understand ourselves only as individuals, and we don't understand ourselves as persons anymore, by the way. A person is an individual, but it... Uh, uh, an individual can be an individual without being a person. We have individual animals, individual objects. Those are all individuals that are discrete. You know, there's this and there's not that. But they're no longer, they don't have an, an, the identity of persons anymore. They lose their personal identity. Once that, th those shifts take place, it radically transforms what we understand as human nature and the nature of God. God is no longer personal. He's impersonal. He's the unmoved mover of Aristotle, except now he's more along the lines of the deists who propose that God is the blind watchmaker who creates a universe, starts it in motion, then pulls himself away. But he's like a mind, not a person, but a mind who creates laws and then the laws work according to how they were set up to work and, and so on and so forth. So personhood gets taken out of the whole worldview, both theologically and anthropologically. Does it make sense? I'm trying to, I mean, I'm oversimplifying and using pictures to illustrate what's going on through the minds of the people there, and I think it's a really good illustration. But note, it's been depersonalized. You say, yes, there's a person. Yeah, but we don't have a face. He just rep represents us. Note that he's an isolated individual as well. From here on in, and I've already mentioned this, but let me reiterate, the heroes of fiction from the Romantic period onward are invariably individuals, and not just individuals, but a particular type, an orphan. Orphans become the heroes of Romantic fiction. They're never heroes. It's not a state to be praised or followed in the periods preceding this. It's a state to be pitied because as an orphan, you have nobody looking after you. You're open to the predation of 
other human beings. People are going to exploit you. If you don't have parents looking after you or an adult, you are easy pickings. You can't look after yourself and you're going to be victimized. The family is gone. There's no family in this. There's just individuals. And because of this individualism, and I, I, I might use the more technically correct term here, autonomy, that's a better understanding here, the autonomous self and the law of the self, because that's what autonomy means. Auto is the word for self in Greek. Not that they have a concept of selfhood, but the law of the self, the law of the self is being demonstrated in this particular painting. And what the man looking into the horizon, I say it's a man, but it's an indiscriminate autonomous individual here looking into the horizon, sees is nothing clear with his sight, but he has certain feelings that come from being at such a height. Have you ever been at a great height standing on top of a peak like this? How do you feel? A sense of grandeur, power. No, maybe terror, but that goes with it. Terror is a part of the experience of the sublime because he feels like at any moment he could be thrown off the side by a gust of wind or something, and yet he's, he's not, he's preserved, so he, there's a sense of enormous power over the very thing that can destroy him, he's not destroyed. And so Nietzsche will build on this and talk about the Übermensch. You ever heard of the Übermensch? The Superman? I'm using the German word here. The Übermensch in Nietzschean thought is uh, it's a technical term that's used in um, climbing. There's a Übermensch and, the, and then there's the Untermensch. And the Übermensch, if you've ever been climbing, it's, it, there are two uh, climbers and you hammer the spike into the side of the mountain. The guy at the top's the Übermensch. He has no rope holding him. If he falls, down he goes. Now, if the spikes are in, then he's gonna get stopped by the rope and so forth. But the point is that he goes up first. And then there's the guy beneath him who's going to be dependent on how high he can go up. That's the Untermensch. Now Nietzsche's idea is that this, this is the Übermensch, but he, by ascending such peaks, will drag along the Untermensch. Now the word Untermensch in Nazi Germany is a very disparaging term, referring to inferior classes of human beings. And if you couple that with a Darwinian notion of natural selection, which promotes the idea of the survival of the fittest, only one of them is going to survive. One, only one of them is fit to survive. What do you do with the Untermenschen if you're going to survive as a people? Nature will do it for you. They'll talk about it as uh, unlivings worthy life, forms of life. Life not worth living. I'm translating from German. And so they'll begin a euthanasia program and so forth against races that are less fit to live, less selected for life. And what will determine the Übermensch? Well, it will be his capacity to be superior to his fellow human beings who are no longer seen as fellow human beings because human being is no longer connected to personhood. It's connected to just the autonomous individual. Well, who are the most autonomous individuals? Those that have technology and science at their fingertips. It's a demonstration of their power and their will to power. So it begins a sort of project of dehumanization, which we're gonna see in the, in the uh, texts that follow over the next month. Uh, a sense of alienation that creeps in through the humanities. Although humanities is the wrong term, through the Geistes, Wissenschaften, the spiritual sciences. And it's from this perspective. It is, okay, so how does this, having said all of that, and you can see it and hopefully understand what I've just said. Wordsworth writes, 
two poems. I'm, I'm just going to read the introduction to one uh, just to show that this is, in fact, what he is doing in his poetry. And this is the preface to The Recluse. And, and, and you'll, you'll hear the echoes of Milton's Paradise Lost on it as his heroic, epic subject matter. And then, we'll, and then we'll read the Immortality Ode and see how he shows this, that his subject matter is, what is it? It's what's going on here inside this man's head. Right here, it's in the mind of man. That's actually the subject of this painting, the mind and his capacity to perceive the sublimity of the landscape. So in other words, if he can perceive the grandeur and the power in the landscape and you're a Kantian, it's because you and your mind has that power. You are gods, effectively. You have godlike powers to perceive things in a way that has not been acknowledged hitherto. And this will be the advance of the epic form. So this is Milton's, the beginning of Milton's preface to the recluse. On man, on nature, and on human life, musing in solitude, I oft perceive fair trains of imagery before me rise, accompanied by feelings of delight, pure or with no unpleasing sadness mixed. And I am conscious of affecting thoughts and dear remembrances whose presence soothes or elevates the mind, intent to weigh the good and evil of our mortal state. To these emotions, whencesoe'er they come, whether from breath of outward circumstance or from the soul, an impulse to herself, I would give utterance in numerous verse of truth, of grandeur, beauty, love and hope, and melancholy fear subdued by faith, of blessed consolations in distress, of moral strength, and intellectual power of joy in widest commonality spread of the individual mind that keeps her own inviolate retirement subject there of conscience only and the law supreme of that intelligence which governs all i sing invocation fit audience let me find though few now in that little quotation which he puts in quotation mark who is he quoting we just read it at the beginning of the semester. Who's he quoting? And where? Book nine. He's worried that he might not have a fit audience for his epic. His concern, Milton's, is not because he's smarter than everyone else. It's because he thinks that his civilization is so decayed and so barbaric that they will no longer be able to see things the way God wants them to see it. Uh, Wordsworth has the same concern, but he doesn't acknowledge that there is a God. He just thinks that there's an intellectual superiority that perhaps nobody else will uh, be able to, to perceive, but it is the epic of the individual mind. Mind which is like other minds. Note that it's not a person. It's not incarnate. It's not a brain. It's not any of those things. It's a mind, and a mind is an immaterial thing. It's the thing that allows thought. But the thought has feeling as its characteristic. He talked about effect, affecting thoughts and dear remembrances whose presence soothes or elevates the mind. So it's a feeling sort of thought, just like the man who is looking here into the horizon has affecting thoughts, feelings about the landscape that are in his mind. And we share that by looking from his perspective. So, so prayed he more gaining than he asked the bard in holiest mood. Note that it's now, now all dependent on his moods. The epic is a matter of having the right feeling when you write it. I gotta be in the right mood to write an epic. More gaining than he asked the bard in holiest mood. Urania, I shall need thy guidance or a greater muse if such descend to earth or dwell in highest heaven. For I must tread on shadowy ground, must sink deep and aloft, ascending, breathe in worlds to which the heaven of heavens is but a veil. Never mind Milton's heaven. There's, a, there's something beyond that. When you go further up and further in, you're not going to 
the real Narnia, there's something that goes beyond that Narnia. And it will have no form whatsoever. Pure spirit. All strength, all terror, single or in bands, whatever was put forth in personal form, whatever was put forth in personal form, oh, heresy. Jehovah, we say Yahweh, now it's the same thing. Jehovah, with his thunder and the choir of shouting angel and the imperial thrones, I pass them unalarmed. Not chaos, not the darkest pit of lowest Erebus, or nor out of blinder vacancy scooped out by help of dreams, can breathe such fear and awe as fall upon us often when we look into our minds, into the mind of man, my haunt and the main region of my song. Now again, where is, who's he echoing here? Milton, in his invocation book one, talks about the main region of his song. Here it's not of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree which brought death into our world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore us. That's not the subject matter, it's the mind of man. So it's the mind, it's an immaterial object. And the subjective impressions that are made upon him by his feelings in association with nature, that's the subject matter henceforward. It's Wordsworth's psychological form of an epic. And it's the one that we continue to employ in uh, our universities to this very day. And I would say almost without distinction. This is a heresy that has overcome the academy. And it is a heresy, I call it that. It's absolutely heretical. It's impersonal human nature. Christ did not take on a divine mind. He took on a human body. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And people saw him and saw his glory, full of grace and truth, right? The incarnation, he had a personal body, the body that is born here by the Madonna. For all of my disparaging comments about the portraiture here. You'll see uglier babies than this, by the way, in the period. Really ugly. Sometimes they're losing their hair. They look like men in their 30s that have, you know, gone pattern baldness and stuff, and like their face is like, oh boy, your baby's really cute. <clears throat> Not. Um, but this is the main region of sound. Now, beauty, a living presence of the earth, surpassing the most fair ideal forms which craft of delicate spirits hath composed from earth's materials, waits upon my steps, pitches her tents before me as I move. Now, to pitch her tent is almost an echo of the incarnation, by the way. John 1.14. To tabernacle. The incarnation. The Lord took on flesh. The word there, he, he's... I think has that in his mind. He's echoing it. It pitches her tents before me as I move in. An hourly neighbor, paradise and groves Elysian, fortunate fields like those of old sought in the Atlantic main, where Atlantis was before it sunk, mentioned in Plato. Why should they be a history only of departed things or a mere fiction of what never was? Words with doubts, the story of scripture. He thinks it's a wonderful fiction, but it's a, just a fictive representation of the real reality, which is the divinity of the human mind. For the discerning intellect of man, when wedded to this goodly universe in love and holy passion, shall find these a simple produce of the common day. I, long before the bliss flower arrives, should chant in lonely verse the spousal verse of this great consummation. And by words which speak of nothing more than what we are, would I arouse the sensual from their sleep of death and win the vacant and the vain of noble raptures. While my voice proclaims how exquisitely the individual mind and the progressive powers, perhaps no less, of the whole species to the external world is fitted and how exquisitely to theme this but little heard of among men the external world is fitted to the mind. Exactly what Kant said. And the creation, by no, by no lower name can it be called, which they with blended might accomplish. This is our high argument. Again, quoting Milton, directly appealing to Milton. So, 
you can see that Wordsworth is bringing in a new theology. It's a replacement theology. It's a theology without personhood. It's related to the mind. It's an internal, it's a spiritual thing, very spiritual. Spiritual at the expense of carnal, as in the physical world. It, it leads to Gnosticism. It leads to um, a denial of human personhood as a category of human reference. In other words, it denies the personhood of the Trinity as well as essential to God's nature. God is a, is a mind like ours perhaps, although we can't really know that except by analogy, but there's no sense of personhood in the church traditional sense of personhood relating to individuals that are distinct. The tri-personal God, the Trinity, it's a, a fundamental category. God in his, in his essence is person. And we by, by, by uh, implication of bearing the image of God are also persons from this which we get from which we get the idea of personal rights from which we get the idea of personal integrity from which we get the idea that you can't kill somebody just because you don't like them or they make you angry why Genesis 9 verse 6 because they bear the image of God that's why it said right there before the commandment against murder they bear the image of God. They are persons. They bear God's image. Therefore, you may not kill them. Right? If, but if you remove the idea of personhood as, as essential to a human being and think that it's just the mind, then killing somebody is really of no particular significance. And this will give rise to mass murder. I'm not saying words where it's a mass murder, but the idea that personhood is not essential to human nature starts to collapse from this period onwards. And we live with the consequences of that to this very day. And you can even cl clothe it as humanitarian. You're just taking the life of somebody who's not worthy of life or not fit for life. Abortion, euthanasia, whatever you want to call it, becomes thinkable for the first time. For the first time since the ancient world. Even in the ancient world, they gave personhood to some people. They don't call it personhood, but the concept of a integrity there and rules surrounding that, they, they exist for some people, men of property. And eventually it gets extended to women and children. That's Christian. That's a Christian legacy. But, but the idea that men have a certain integrity and you can't just do anything to them, that's there in even pagan thought. Do you see what's going on here at any rate? Um, th so that's the great shift here. And uh, I'll just stop with that because I want to move on to the next one. But any comments or questions about what I just said? Because I'm throwing a lot at you and purposefully so, because I want the big picture. And I get that by being very touching on the key points and not digging down too much. But this is the huge shift. And Wordsworth is the great speaker uh, who articulates it in verse that is uh, representative of the age and the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, but also presents it in ways that are very appealing. He, he makes it uh, attractive. Yes? Would you say that this like, ideology or whatever is like, still like, what is held today, or has there been like, further shift? So, um, what do you think? I don't want to turn it back. I'm happy I'm not evading the question. Right, yeah. I have very clear ideas, and I'm not um, afraid of expressing them, as you can tell. What do you think? I mean, you've kind of mentioned a little to bit. To some degree. So, 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 Jordan Peterson, for example, his, uh, the psychologist, mm -hmm. uh, much beloved of conservatives these days and hated by for some reason by non-conservatives. I, I don't understand it at all, but I guess because he speaks against gender ideologies and so forth, it's, which he hasn't really done actually. He's just saying, I object to being told what I can say and think, <laughs> which seems a pretty reasonable and pretty low level objection, quite frankly. You can't tell me this, what to say and what to think. You know, and everyone's like, oh, how could he, how dare he? And I'm thinking, no, really, is that 
problematic. He's not even saying he won't say it. He's saying you can't force me to think that. There's something fundamentally I'm going to defend my ground on that because I think right on you, absolutely. But his program for dealing with this is a self-authoring program. It's called self-authoring. It's a rather extraordinary thing as, a, as, a, as an antidote to chaos. It, there's a self-authoring program. You're going to author yourself. And Christians buy into it. I find that extraordinary. Um, you have an author, if you want to present it in such terms. It's called God. <laughs> you don't have to author yourself, and you can't author yourself because you didn't make yourself, and you can't remake yourself. Actually, that's what the gender ideology theorists claim, is that this man whose self depends on his thoughts can conceive of himself entirely and construct himself. However he wants to be, you can put whatever face you want on him. He can wear blackface. <laughs> Reference to the current prime minister. Never mind, I don't seek to take a shot. Um, he could have whatever face he wants. He could be the joker. Right? Whatever, he can have a mask on. Doesn't matter. You can be anything there. That's the point. Like it's just because it's not related to who you are. You don't, you don't see the person because the person really isn't what you see anyway. It's what's inside of your head. And you can express that however you want. And you can keep on changing it without contradiction because there's no correspondence visible to who you actually are. Who you really are is in your feelings and your feelings only you have. I have no access to your feelings unless you share them. And even when you share them, I still am, I, I'm not, I don't have them in the same way. Although in this period, they really try to do it. And you know how they try and do it? They try to do it through empathy, not sympathy. And like, uh, you know, I'm so sorry to hear that. It's like, I feel your pain. I feel your pain. You gotta have the look in your eyes as well. <laughs> and if you weep, you're even better at it. And you have to have a, you know, the quivery voice and stuff. Then I'm empathizing. Well, then I'm getting closer to you, who you are, because you are the feeling disturbed thing inside your head. You're trapped in that. And technology actually reinforces this idea of a disembodied self, by the way. Which is why all sorts of, I mean, I think the technology of the smartphone is concurrent with the rise of transgenderism. It's concurrent with it. I don't want to say it's the cause, but I think it's a, it's a helpful way of conceiving yourself in a disembodied fashion. You can see your face on the camera. And you may not like the look of yourself on the camera. Most people don't. That's why I don't watch my own stupid videos. But, um, but if you're in a chat room in a Zoom call, a lot of people black themselves out so they don't have, they're happy to see somebody else. You don't want to see yourself. Because all you see is what you don't like about your face, whatever that is. And, but there's a sense of that my face is a, a, is a disappointment to me. And my feelings are distressed at what I see. And so again, it reinforces this idea that your feelings are actually you and the person that you see is distant from you. You want away from that sense and you can do surgeries to make yourself with a, you know, the right nose and get a nose job and get the cheek job and the injections and the hair things and all that sort of stuff or gender surgery or any, whatever, doesn't matter. You can make yourself the way you conceive yourself ideally, what that will look like. First here, yes. And then I'm gonna get back to Wordsworth, but I, did, I, I want to illustrate there are large implications to this shift. That's, that's the whole point, yes. Social media just leads to the bullying, uh, but it also, because it works through, um, social media works through uh, finding your particular niche and pushing content to you according to the identity characteristics that it has for you, male, female, whatever, location, all that sort of thing. And, and it notes what you, you're, it traces you, it tracks you, and then pushes material that it thinks that you're gonna like. And it increasingly polarizes you and makes you, gives you an identity 
that sees things that, well, what's the opposite to you? And those are the things that you're most going to respond to. It makes you angry about things that are very different from you. And that encourages you to click because people are motivated by anger or outrage more than they are by, by delight. Just sad. That, I mean, the news industry has worked that way for hundreds of years. Sensationalism. So it's a clickbaity stuff. So social media has reinforced it, but the idea that you're disembodied, I think the technology is what furthers that. But, but the social media encourages uh, people to get attacked. And they're, they're so afraid of being attacked that they will want to remove the thing that causes the offense. Like, oh my goodness, she's, she's so ugly, or whatever. Or you see the size of her nose, what a schnoz. Or whatever. I don't know what people say. I'm making up stuff. <laughs> Do these people even say schnoz anymore? No. It's good if I use antiquated things anyway, so I don't appear cool because I'm not cool. Um, yeah, so I think social media is a part of it, but that more because of the way it, it pushes you to be polar opposites and sees your enemy and it gets you to click on things that you don't like and then etc. And And if you want to be popular, well, then you push... Uh, p opinions that you know are are offensive to a group, and that but that also will draw people to your side, and you make a lot of money that way. Terrible. Where's the discussion? Where's the common ground? Well, the common ground would be in in logic, in conversation, but that would depend on a, an, a view of human nature that would think that the logos, rationality, was a part of a common ground. And we don't have a common ground anymore because we're all just this guy, autonomous individuals that identify in accordance with non-common properties, right? So this guy will be in one camp and there'll be another guy in another mountain who will be in the opposite camp. And these will be the political positions, two extremes, but there is no common ground. So they can't actually unite in any way. The unification was in Christ, the one whose image we bear. That, that gone, that removed from the university, theology gone, and all of the implications of it, it's nothing left but, but fighting. That's the problem. Yes? So the three laws of logic uh, of Aristotle are the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and what's the third? The law of the excluded middle. But the law of identity depends on being able to distinguish something as having this and not that, right? And it can't be both, because it can't contradict. But identity depends on having certain attributes that you can identify. And if the identity characteristics are not part of human nature as a common feature, but are only there as specific parts of a group, which is why we call them identity groups, then we've lost the commonality of identity that is what we call humanity. Humanity has fallen out of the humanities. It's not, we can't argue our way into it because they, they'll say that actually reason is not essential to human nature, feeling is. And feeling, guess what, is not of something that you can discuss. I feel angry. I'm sorry. But I, <laughs> that, that's all you can say. Or you can be scared or whatever, but you can't, sh you can't argue. There's no discussion about feelings. This is how I feel. Well, you feel how you feel. And, and at, at best I can say, well, I empathize with your anger. I, I think your anger is justified. But there's no discussion of that. You can't say, well, actually, even though I feel your anger is justified, you're, it's misplaced because you've made the wrong judgment about things. You're wrong about this particular subject. In this worldview, you can't appeal to things, and nobody's ever wrong, because feelings are always right, because feelings are essential to the nature of the person, and you can't appeal to something outside of that, namely logic. And we can't use words even. 
because words will distinguish truth from falsehood again. Right? So it, it gets caught in a serious heretical uh, position where, uh, that you can't get out of. Or you would have to appeal outside the system. And I think I do appeal outside the system. That's the importance of the Christian faith. It's, it's essential. I didn't become a Christian because it was um, advantageous to me. I became it because it was true and because I regard it as essential to the humanities. Not just my humanity, but the humanities in general and everybody's humanity, I think, furthermore. But anyway, yes? So like Wordsworth, like his, like what he's pushing forward as far as like healings and things like that, like, do you think he would freak out at like the, the mod, like today? Oh, he would, yeah. Like, cause it, it's so would Kant. So much further. Oh, yeah, I, I think they are totally ob oblivious to the long term consequences of this breach, the subjective turn. Oh, yeah. They think it's universal. They think that, that this is going to be a, a, a new form of spirituality that's more inclusive than, uh, than Christianity was. It will include all races. There's a spirituality that encompasses them all. And, uh, and, and he's bringing it in. So um, pan-Sophism and uh, so forth are, emerges in this period. And, uh, and, and Unitarianism actually really takes off in the late 18th century and the 19th century doesn't go away. The idea that the Trinity is a, an irrational position takes on great, a great deal of strength in this period. It, yes? And then I'm going to go to the poem. Very briefly. Mm -hmm. um, you've been talking a lot about kind of the dark side oh, gosh. of the romanticism. Yes. And, we're, and Lewis. Yeah, there seems like a different spin on it. They have a very different spin on it, and I think that they are naive. How dare I? <laughs> I think that they, Wordsworth, uh, Lewis loved Wordsworth, one of his favorite poets, mm -hmm. because he is speaking of something that's deeply moving and that they feel is correct. And the holiness of the heart's affections, to use uh, Keats's phrase. Um, they all speak to that, and I think there's something there, but I think they're mistaking the nature of what they're actually confronting here. I think they're a little bit, because there's a common ground, they assume too much, and they're not uh, uh, sufficiently aware of the problematic nature of this, although I think that Lewis, in his sci-fi trilogy and in The Abolition of Man, is very acute to the consequences of the dehumanization that takes place from the mid-19th century onward. In fact, he, he, he identifies it right there in the mid-19th century. He's just wrong about the dating, but that's another topic. This poem, I haven't even got to the poem. I've got, what, 15 minutes left? That was, you know, anyway. This is called Ode, Intermations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood. What he's going to categorize, what he's going to describe here is everything we've talked about the, to this point. But he's going to, again, just like he did in, Tin, in Tintern Abbey, where he talks about five years hence and the memory of that period and it affects who he is, he's going to come at it from a different angle here and try and describe growing up and what happens when you get older. So let me read some of this. Can you see it in the back? Now you can. There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream the earth and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore, turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I now can see no more. So already at the outset, there was light when he was a child. The days were long, the days were happy, he was not troubled by life in general. I guess Wordsworth had a happy childhood. His father died when he was about 10. So he could probably speak from personal experience. At that point, you can read it in the, in the prelude, uh, life changed significantly. Announcement of his father's death deeply affected him, as you can imagine. He comes at it again. The rainbow comes and goes, and lovely is the rose. The moon doth with delight look round her when the heavens are bare. 
Waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair. The sunshine is a glorious birth. But yet I know, where'er I go, that there hath passed away a glory from the earth. Now, while the birds thus sing a joyous song, and while the young lambs bound as to a tabor's sound, to me alone there came a thought of grief. A timely utterance gave that thought relief. And I again am strong. The cataracts blow their trumpets from the steep. No more shall grief of mine the season wrong. I hear the echoes through the mountains throng. The winds come to me from the fields of sleep, and all the earth is gay. Land and sea give themselves up to jollity, and with the heart of May doth every beast keep holiday. Thou child of joy, shout round me. Let me hear thy shouts, thou happy shepherd boy. Note the same characters that we see in Blake's poems as well, shepherd boys, nature, etc. Ye blessed creatures, I have heard the call ye to each other make. I see the heavens laugh with you in your jubilee. My heart is at your festival, my head hath its coronal. The fullness of your bliss, your bliss I feel. I feel it all. O oh, evil day, if I were sullen while earth herself is adorning this sweet May morning, and the children are culling on every side in a thousand valleys far and wide, fresh flowers. While the sun shines warm and the babe leaps up on his mother's arm, I hear, I hear with joy, I hear. But there's a tree of many, one. A single field which I have looked upon, both of them speak of something that is gone. The pansy at my feet doth the same tale repeat. Whither is fled the visionary gleam? Where is it now, the glory and the dream? Now, this is the, how he began the ode. He wrote this, and then years later, he added what comes after this. But there's a, a pause here, and you can note that, that the uh, history of the creation of this poem is reflected to some degree in a, a, a pause and a return to the subject matter. It's pretty evident here. But what he's describing in the, in the first four stanzas is a loss of the visionary gleam that he had when he was a child. And remember, if you go remember back to Tintern Abbey, he talked about when the first time was when he was at the Tintern Abbey, he ran around in nature without any sense of loss, without any sense of distinction from it, without any sense of disunity. He was just one with nature. He was running around in delight, no distress. And then it's gone. And now he comes up with his proposal for this. And what he proposes is a doctrine at which he acknowledges in a letter afterwards uh, that Plato writes about, which is a, a, is a theory for how we come to know things and how we come to forget things. And I'm going to write it down here. I think it's in the Mino, Plato's Mino. It's called anamnesis, it's recollection, remembrance. It's a theory for how we come to know things. There are two, there are two theories for it. Actually, there's probably more than two, but there are two that are enunciated by Plato and Aristotle. Uh, the one is, and the, it's the Aristotelian one, which we get from modern science, is that we know things by experience, o observation of things around us, we learn through experience. Most people think that that's the only way of knowing or the only explanation that we could ever come up about with of, of knowing things. It's through experience and then learning from your experience. But Plato proposes something else and he proposes it as a, we already know everything. And the task of the educator is to bring to remembrance 
what we know and have forgotten. So the, the way in which Aristotle could be described as the mind's a blank slate. John Locke calls it the tabula rasa. And then experience comes in and adds you know, color dots into it and connects the dots and so forth. And that's your experience. And eventually on the basis of all that experience, the blank slate gets covered. It's referred to regularly by psychologists and others as well. The mind is a blank slate. But Plato says and it's not so. We have an, in, an innate knowledge of certain things. Justice, beauty, goodness, truth, these are what he calls the ideal forms. He says, we know these. We don't have to be taught them. We don't learn them from experience. We know them intuitively. And Plato has good support for what he says in, in this respect. Children in the playground know immediately whether something's fair or unfair because they regularly say it to one another. That's not fair. Where did they get this idea of fairness from? A little baby who's not even able to speak will be angry at something that the baby sees in front of her. You know, the food, mom's eating the food before giving it to me, red face. Anger, you didn't give me what I want. That's not fair, it's not just. You can, and the child's not articulating, but you can see anger. Why is the child angry? It's not the child's hungry, the child's angry. That's what the red face, remember the face declares something. The tears, the, the rage, you can see the, a sense of it's not right. Plato says that this is innate. It comes with the human being. Now this will give rise to what Lewis will call the Tao, a moral sense in human nature, which is as much a part of our human natures as our physical nature. We have a moral nature that comes with being a human being. And we can show that it's there. Plato does it in, in the Mino, I think it is. Uh, by teaching a child mathematics who knows nothing about mathematics on the basis of logic which the child intuitively understands because it's the way the child's mind works. It's the way, by the way, my, a, a number is not an empirical object. It's an abstract necessity for us to comprehend the world. As is geometry. geometry actually, you can't even get into Plato's Academy without knowing geometry. It's an ordering of the whole world. It says it on the gate of the academy, no entry without knowledge of geometry. It explains ma the, the material world, but it explains it in terms of the numbers that underlie what we call the triangle, the circle, the square, et cetera, the things you learn in uh, school mathematics. And so he comes up with a theory of anamnesis. Now, what does he mean by this? Well, he means that we recollect what we forgot and then, in accordance with the thinking of the day, and this is probably the primary way that the ancient world does understand it, when we die, we go down to the underworld, and after a thousand years, you're dipped in the river Lethe, and then you forget everything, and then you're reincarnated. Plato also believes in reincarnation. But the soul then loses its specific identity that comes from being whatever you were, a man or a woman, a good man, a bad man, whatever, and you're reincarnated and take on another nature, etc. Right? Well, whether right or not, that's Plato's view. And, and just as a thought experiment, Wordsworth is suggesting that that is what's going on here, which is why there's light at the beginning and it keeps getting darker. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting, the soul that rises with us, our life's star hath hath elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar, not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison house begin to close upon the growing boy, but he beholds the light and whence it flows, he sees it in his joy. The youth who daily farther from the east must travel, still is nature's priest. Note that he's growing old very quickly here. He begins as a boy, then he becomes a youth, and he's going further and further to the east, thinking biblically, he's walking east. What happens east is it's the land of death. He's walking away from the Garden of Eden. And as he does so, he gets older and older and gets more and more dead. Spiritually, he loses sight. He still is nature's priest, and by the vision splendid is on his way attendant. At length, the man, the boy, the youth, the man perceives it die away and fade into the light of common day. 
So there's still light, but it's not the celestial light. It's not the spiritual light. We grow older and we forget that there's something in us which is more than a physical being. And this is why Wordsworth is regarded as a spiritual writer in a good sense. He denies what the empiricists say or the materialists say. He says, no, there's something to human nature that is spiritual and we all know it. Everyone knows it. And everyone who is, has any sort of faith feels the power of Wordsworth's words here, I think. Earth fills her lap with pleasures of her kind, but note he's talking about a progression here, and it's a progressive loss of vision. Earth fills her lap with pleasures of her own yearnings, hath she in her own natural kind, and even with something of a mother's mind, and no unworthy aim, the homely nurse. So by, okay, so I talked about the, the what was it, the boy, the youth, the man. Now we'll talk about the earth as what? A mother, a homely nurse, her foster child, her inmate. She gets worse and worse and worse. She became, begins as a mother, then she's a nurse. She still suckles the infant, but it's not her child. Then it becomes a foster child. And then finally, she's a prisoner, prison guard, because the mind is also becoming a prison house. And she, the prison keeper, she's the jailer along the way. Forget the glories he hath known. That's what she does. And, and, what, and that imperial palace whence he came. Now let's come at it again. Behold the child among his newborn blisses. Back to the, the little baby or the child. A six years darling of a pygmy size. See where mid work of his own hand he lies, fretted by sallies of his mother's kisses. Stop it. Little boy annoyed. I'm big. Stop kissing me with light upon him from his father's eyes. See at his feet some little plan or chart, some fragment from his dream of human life, shaped by himself with newly learned art, a wedding or a festival, a mourning or a funeral, and this hath now his heart. And unto this he frames his song. Then, and now this is the next stage, he will fit his tongue to dialogues of business, love or strife, he's getting a little older, conflict, but it will not be long ere this be thrown aside, and with new joy and pride the little actor cons another part, filling from time to time his humorous stage with all the persons down to the palsied age. You'll act like grandpa. And everyone's laughing. That all the things that life brings it with her in her equipage, as if his whole vocation were endless imitation. This is a sign of the fall imitation. It's the characteristic artistic feature prior to, to romantic poetics. Mimesis, imitation. It's the way we learn. We learn, think of Odysseus, think of Telemachus. Telemachus had no role model. He had no one to imitate. He had no one to follow. Think of Christian, Christian uh, doctrine and life. We're to follow Jesus. We're to imitate him or to be like him. L Wordsworth's uh, sense is that by imitating other people, we're less ourselves. We lose the sense of individuality, which is what makes us who we are, namely this. We move away from this and we become like other people who are not us. There's a loss in the process. Thou, now he's addressing the child, whose exterior semblance doth belie thy soul's immensity, thou best philosopher, just give me a minute here, who yet dost keep thy heritage, thou I among the blind, that deaf and silent reads the eternal mind, haunted forever by the eternal mind, speaking to the child, mighty prophet, seer blessed, on, whose, on whom those truths do rest, which we are toiling all our lives to find, in darkness lost, the darkness of the grave. Thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day, a master or a slave, a presence which is not to be put by, to whom the grave is but a lonely bed without the sense or sight or of day or of the warm light, a place of thought where we in waiting lie. Thou, little child, yet glorious in the might of heaven-born freedom on thy being's height. And here's the great question. Why with such earnest pains dost thou provoke the years to bring the inevitable yoke thus blindly with thy blessedness at strife? Why do you run towards sin. 
Why do you run towards death? Why do you act as if the material world had anything to do with you? Why do you imitate and not be original? Be yourself. Don't be like other people. Because this is blindly with thy blessedness at strife. Full soon thy soul shall have her earthly freight, and custom lie upon thee with a weight heavy as frost and deep almost as life. I'm going to stop there and come back to it, but let me one final comment. He sees that it's not only internally, the child walks away, moves towards experience, and with the experience, it's entirely negative. He brings about the fall. Something in our human nature moves away from goodness and towards socialization. We become socialized. It's at odds with who we are. It's at odds with our feelings. We want to be like everybody else. Why? Be unique. Don't be like everyone else. Don't conform to reason. Don't conform to society. That's what the romantic wants us to be. Be this guy. Be the autonomous individual. Author yourself. Be the self-interpreting orphan that you see in Dickens' fiction in Little Orphan Annie, in Anne of Green Gables, in all the comic book heroes from Spider-Man to Superman to, and onwards up to Harry Potter. Be the, that individual. Look within yourself. You have the strength within you to be yourself. Be that person. Don't be like everyone else. It lies within you. The divinity lies within you. Wordsworth's pressure. I'll come back to this poem at the beginning of next class, but I'm done. I'm out of time. Apologies for that. <laughs>